Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we talked to Dr. Kirsten Seabach, a Martian geologist from Rice University, talking about her work uncovering secrets of the climate on ancient Mars. But first, we study a newly discovered system of exoplanets featuring an extreme world of molten lava. Next, we learn about a so-called cotton candy planet, delicious, with a density so low it wasn't thought possible. Finally, closer to home, we take a look at a new study revealing that Gale Crater on Mars may have once resembled Iceland before talking to one of the lead researchers on that study. Astronomers studying data from the TESS spacecraft have recently found an intriguing family of planets featuring an extreme rocky world of molten magma. The TOI 561 planetary system found 280 light years from Earth is found to have at least three planets. The innermost of this planetary trio is TOI 561b, a rocky world not much larger than Earth. However, this world orbits so close to its sun that the surface is likely composed of molten lava. And this extreme exoplanet also orbits at a breathtaking rate, circling its stellar parent once every 12 hours. A new study of the exoplanet WASP-107b shows this gas giant has a density lower than what astronomers thought was possible. This so-called cotton candy planet is as large as Jupiter, but has only one-tenth the mass of the king of our solar system. Astronomers previously believed that gas giants like Jupiter could only form around rocky cores ten times as massive as Earth or larger. But WASP-107b is just 40% of that so-called minimum size. A study of climates around Earth has revealed a surprising fact about ancient Mars. The climate of the red planet three billion years ago, at least around Gale Crater, was surprisingly like modern-day Iceland. A team from Rice University made the finding while seeking to better understand the climatic conditions present when layers of sedimentary rocks examined by Curiosity rover were formed. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we're joined by Dr. Kirsten Seabach of Rice University, one of the leaders on this new study examining the climate of the ancient Mars. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Kirsten Seabach. Uh, she is a Martian geologist at Rice University and has found uh, that ancient Mars may have looked eerily familiar. Welcome to the show, Kirsten. Thanks. Thanks. It's good to be here. Yeah. 
So uh, take us back three billion years or so, if you would, and uh, tell us what was what was it like on ancient Mars? Yeah, so we're using observations from the Curiosity rover. So that's driving around in Gale Crater. So we're about three degrees away from the equator, just south of it on the southern highlands of Mars. Uh, and this crater is like 110 miles across. So, and it's about four or five kilometers deep. Uh, so it's, it's actually quite a deep crater that we're in. So if you were to look around you, you're seeing mountains on all sides as the crater rim. Uh, and three and a half billion years ago, this crater was full of water. Uh, there, was, there was a significant lake in the middle of it. I suppose we don't actually know whether that lake filled up the entire area around the crater. Uh, we know that there was at least one rocky island. There's a central peak right in the middle of the crater where when the impactor hit, the rock rebounded up and actually reached heights near the same height as the crater around it. So there's one tall mountain in the middle, but otherwise there's at least one lake kind of going around. We, we don't know the exact depth of the lake. Curiosity has been driving through lake sediments for an extended period of time, for about five, six years now. Uh, so we've covered about 400 vertical meters of these lake sediments. In this recent paper, we're looking at just uh, the bottom portion of those lake sediments where we have, we have a lot of the chemistry data. And we looked at the chemistry ratios that tell us about weathering as the rocks are being pulled from their volcanic sources outside the crater and being carried in in rivers and deposited in the bottom. And we, and we basically just used uh, different locations on Earth to say, you know, how much weathering occurs with this kind of rock in different climates and what climate variable is most important for dictating how much weathering occurs. And what we found was that temperature was the most important variable and that the temperature based on the amount of weathering in the rocks on Mars, the amount of weathering looked just like Iceland. The clays looked just like the clays that we're seeing in Iceland today. And so based on that, you know, this, this area, it did have a lake, it had rivers coming in, but it was probably still really quite cold. Um, Iceland rarely has temperatures above about 38 Fahrenheit. And so, so we're envisioning ourselves in this crater three and a half billion years ago. Iceland makes it a lot easier to do that. We can actually go to Iceland where it kind of looks like Mars and it turns out it's about the right temperature. Hmm. That's fascinating. So what were, um, what were some of the tools and the techniques that you used? Because I mean, you know, Curiosity has only been in Gale Crater for so long as it's only had so long to collect, collect the data that it has, remarkable as it is. But how were you able to extrapolate all this information from, from the data collected? Yeah, we used two different comparison techniques. One of them was based on mineralogy and, and one of them is based on chemistry. So mineralogy, we're looking at what clays form in the water. And the clays that form are basically just the secondary minerals as, as the original volcanic rocks, the original volcanic minerals have water running through them. And they start to lose different cations and they start to get transformed. Uh, so the chemistry, sorry, I've come at this twice. The chemistry side is saying that as water is, is passing by these minerals, it sometimes strips away the cations that are easiest to dissolve in the water. So we looked for the ratio of the cations um, to aluminum, which stays still. It's called the chemical index of alteration. It's actually, it's used all over Earth as well. Uh, on the mineral side, we looked at what secondary minerals were forming, what clay minerals were actually forming, and we used the XRD patterns, the X-ray diffraction patterns that Curiosity observes, and compared those to XRD, same kind of diffraction patterns uh, of sediments coming downstream in Iceland. And we isolated those to the finest grain size uh, so that they'd be comparable to the mudstones that Curiosity was observing. And for both of those comparisons, uh, the Icelandic rocks look very similar. The, the amount of cations that have been removed, the ratio of cations that have been removed, and the minerals that have formed both look similar. And so, that, so those two techniques um, enhance the comparison. Hmm. And so by, you know, looking at, um, you know, we know that, you know, at one time Mars had a significant amount of water, you know, 
in places, especially like Gale Crater, where Curiosity is, and Jezero Crater, which we'll talk about later. Um, but um, are we able to get any hints about possible uh, habitability of primitive life forms in the ancient Martian climate? Yeah, uh, so that is that is the big question we are wondering about, right? Is there is there life on Mars? Can like can Mars tell us about um, the origin of life? And and the key thing there is just that the sediments we're looking at are three and a half billion years old. That's basically about the time that we think life evolved on Earth, and so and so we're definitely constantly keeping that in mind because we want to understand what the geological conditions are when life formed or or on planets without life, maybe, right? It's right in that kind of uh, series of questions that we're really, uh, we're really excited by this idea of habitability and, and was Mars a place where Earth-like life could have formed or could have lived? What we found is that the, the area that we're talking about in that paper, the area right near the base of the crater especially, definitely held lakes that were habitable for Earth-like life. They, they had schnapps, they had all the elements they needed they had energy sources, both from the sun and from chemical redox radiance. And they had water for extended periods of time. And that water wasn't super salty or super acidic or anything. Instead, it was clement conditions. And, and with that criterion, we established that these places are habitable. Uh, what's been really exciting from the Curiosity mission, and, and it's a little bit outside the scope of this paper, is that the, the that those clays um, in, the, in the ancient lakes, the same kind of clays that I was just talking about for this paper comparing to Iceland, actually they formed within the lake. And the way that clay barrels oh. form, they have, they have a series of layers that get stacked. And they can actually kind of, in between those layers, trap whatever's going on in the lake. And so it makes them a really great place to find ancient organics. And there are actually multiple samples from the base of this uh, lake sequence where we have found organic molecules. So, so carbon-based molecules were present in this lake on Mars at that time, <laughs> and they've been preserved to today. Doesn't fully answer your question. Now we, now we just kind of know some of our constraints, right? Now we actually have this additional parameter that says, okay, now look at temperatures like Iceland. Mm -hmm. That's kind of changing for life. Um, especially for the origin of life, it might have happened in a warmer spot, uh, but it still helps us constrain what we're looking for. Um, and there could have been warmer spots either outside the crater or in different zones or different groundwater episodes within the crater. And once life is there, it can thrive in cooler temperatures. Uh, that's fascinating. And um, now Perseverance is going to land on, on Mars on on February 18th, and you are one of the lucky people who uh, gets to drive that thing around. First, how does that feel? That must be incredible. So excited. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> running down for that landing day. Um, just so excited to get to work with the team. Uh, those those samples, really, with Mars sample return, I mean, it'll, it'll probably be a decade before they get returned to Earth. But then those samples will lead to new discoveries for decades. And, and so being on the team that gets to help figure out the geology and pick out the samples, I am thrilled. It's <laughs> great. You know, first of all, I have to ask, you know, do you, do you ever have dreams of just like, you know, setting up to pull wheelies in this thing or, you know, try, try your initials on Mars for all time? <laughs> Then I mostly just don't want to be the one that gets it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, I think there was a big fan theory episode about that. <laughs> Darn you, Howard. Um, so how, how seriously, how do you pick, you know, how do you pick places to go and, you know, where, where, where how do you choose where you're going to drive this fantastic rover? It is all a big team effort. And so we have something like 400 or 500 scientists around the world of all different stripes, scientists and engineers, physicists, laboratory people, field people, atmospheres, rock, right? And, and <laughs> you've probably been on a road trip driving your car and picked which route you were gonna take. And if you had more than one person in the car, you probably disagree, 
right? But you have roads <laughs> to the side. It's happened. <laughs> 400, 400 people and one car and no roads. Right? <laughs> it is a real challenge. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of it ends up coming down to compromise to. Um, to making plans at all different scales, even if things on Mars never go quite as expected. So the plan isn't quite what you turn back to, but you make your plan for your two years, you make your plan for one year, you make your plan for one month, you make your plan for one week, and you make your plan for one day. Um, and for all of those plans, you do a lot of, of collaborating, <laughs> of, of kind of learning to communicate and establish what things are really important to see. Um, and mm -hmm. then and then working with a whole team of scientists to figure out how to prioritize those and, and make as many as you can fit in the rover's schedule. All right, so what kind of features are you most excited to explore? What, what is really lighting your fires about, about this mission? Uh, with, with Perseverance, we're gonna be yeah. landing in Jezero Crater. It's this ancient crater containing a big delta and that that delta is pulling in sediment um, the delta is just where the river enters a lake and drops all its sediment. It's bringing in sediment from highlands that are some of the oldest areas on Mars where we know there were volcanic rocks interacting with water. So we've got, it's, it's two environments here. We've got both a crater lake, it's probably like Gale Crater, envision something just like what we were just envisioning for Gale, um, slightly different part of Mars, but, but we had a calm lake where you're probably forming clay minerals and, and preserving whatever's there. And then we get to crawl out or we get to look at those rocks that have come in. And those are kind of the, the volcanic hot springs kind of areas where it's another idea of where life could have started. Um, so I'm so excited to see both of those. One of the things that's, uh, that attracted us to Jezero Crater was the presence of carbonate minerals. Mm. So in addition to clay minerals, those are another type that form really early on in the water usually. And because they form rapidly, they're kind of salts that grow quickly, they're a great place to preserve fossils. So if you've seen limestones anywhere, you've probably noticed little, little fossils in limestones and in rocks and buildings and things. So um, really excited to see the carbonates, really excited for that kind of dueling habitable environments and really excited for whatever surprises we find when we get there, because that's really what always happens with these missions. We have predictions, we have plans, and, and we find more than we ever expected. That's, that's pretty amazing. And just tell us a little bit um, about, about this mission and about the samples that you'll be collecting and how they're going to eventually get back to Earth. Yeah, so uh, it's a rover. It looks kind of like Curiosity. So it's kind of a small SUV size um, mission, but it's its main purpose, instead of Curiosity, which is a roving laboratory with laboratory instruments to analyze drilled samples that it collects. This one drills, but it instead of collecting drill powder, it collects a rock core. And it's a core actually about the size of your pinky. And it puts those into these specially designed sealed tubes. We have about three dozen sealed tubes and, uh, and so the goal of, for the people driving it is to go find the best 30-ish samples that we can, uh, collect them, put them in these little sealed tubes, again, about the size of your pinky, we'll drop that pile of sealed tubes on the surface, and then there are two follow-on missions, and this is a cooperative effort between NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA. Uh, the second mission will land, it'll send out a little rover, it'll go over and grab each of those samples, bring them back to its lander where it has kind of a, a launcher set up that'll launch <laughs> that whole set of samples into orbit around Mars. <laughs> a third mission will come from Earth. It'll grab those samples from going around Mars and bring them back to Earth. And this is our first time bringing Mars samples that we've collected, that we have context for, back to Earth um, for analysis. And so we're so excited to get those, you know, in about a decade. <laughs> wow. Wow, uh, that's great. And of course, you know, in speaking of the European Space Agency, they have the Rosalind Franklin rover headed to Mars in 2022. Um, what are you hoping to get out of that? What are you, how are you hoping to, what are you hoping to learn from that mission? 
yeah, with each new mission, we, we gain a new set of observations and a new point around Mars. And so um, Rosalind Franklin's going to a different location, not either, not a crater delta, um, but, but kind of wider planes with interesting kind of large scale stratigraphy um, or large scale layering of different types of rock. And so between the, th I mean, Mars, Mars is a lot smaller than Earth, but if you took all the land area on Earth and squished it together, it's the same land area as Mars. So we've been to Mars eight times. We've landed on Mars eight times. With Perseverance, that'll be nine. With Rosalind Franklin, 10. If, uh, and China's got a mission going. Just think about if you were trying to understand Earth and you had been to New York and Houston and Sydney, but you hadn't been to the Outback or you hadn't been to Brazil or the Amazon. Um, right. Every single mission, especially if they go to a different type of site and they bring a different type of instrument, really changes how we understand the whole system. Um, and, so, and so with Curiosity's observations, we've, we've got a new version of what we think Mars looks like in our head, but there's certainly more to find and we won't know what that is until we get more data from a few more sites. Um, and certainly before we start sending people, it'd be great to, to have a little bit of a better map of, of different sites on Mars and what they can tell us and what the environment is like at each site. Um, both in terms of the present environment that humans would be experiencing and in terms of these ancient environments that, that excite me, that tell us about what Mars looked like at that time when it looked more similar to Earth. Um, and so, so just so excited to get more data points. Um, same with the Chinese rover. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that as well. So thank you so much for being on the show, Kirsten. It was, it was wonderful talking with you. Oh yeah, it's great. Everyone mark your calendars. So excited to see Perseverance land. <laughs> it's going to be great. And that was uh, Dr. Kirsten Seabach, um, Martian geologist at Rice University. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.